All right, everybody, this week on Three Sides of the Coin, if you notice, it's just me and Tommy. We got the A team on this week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The A team. You know, the B, the B team is left the Taking building. a break. So you get that B team break? Mm hmm. Yeah. yeah, the real talent's in the house. <laughs> Absolutely. So this week on Three Sides, we have Derek Sherinian, uh, keyboard player. Uh, played with uh, Kiss and Alice and a slew of other amazing, talented artists. Um, he also tells a story about Eddie Van Halen. And we talk a little bit about some of the Kiss auctions um, that you're seeing on, on Facebook. So tune in. Tune in. A team. Yes. Go Steelers. This is Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things. Kiss. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Welcome to this week's Three Sides of the Coin, guys. I am your host, Tommy Summers, with my wonderful co-host, Lisa Martini. You notice there's here. only two of us today. Yeah, the two chowderheads are not with us. So we are running the show. The insane people are running the asylum this week. And we are very, very happy because Lisa and I actually get to chat. We actually get to talk. We get to ask questions and interact with the guests. So we're not used to that, uh -uh. you know, because the other two are just both such egomaniacs that, uh, you, you know. You can't get a word in edgewise with them. You can't. You, you just can't. So unfortunately, Michael is uh, not here this week. He is with his family. His father, Gene, uh, has a few health things that Michael is helping out with with the family. I believe he'll be back next week. And Mark is uh, still pouting. He's pouting on a beach, though. I think he's down in Florida right now. But uh, he needs a new computer before we can let him come back on the show because, you know, his internet and his connection and everything sucks. And I think it's because he's got... Um, Windows 97, I think is what he's running. So anyways, Lisa and I are going to be your hosts today. Lisa, how have you been? I've been good. I haven't seen you much lately. Oh no, I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm sorry. Loving the dark hair, it looks fantastic. You know, I did my roots, see that? Your roots, your roots, nice. Trying to make myself look better. Well, so what the hell's the deal with your Steelers? What, what's the deal with them? They're playing now tonight. No, they're not. Aren't they? Okay, wait a minute, Tommy. Do you really think that if the Steelers are playing? Come on. Oh, is it tomorrow night? Yeah, they moved it to tomorrow. Oh, good Lord. I know, three times. Uh, why don't they play with whoever was there at the time? Well, that's what they're supposed to do. Right. So why, why is this other team getting a pass with the Steelers? Because they whine and bitch and complain because they didn't have practice time and na 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 and Lamar Jackson had the COVID so you know he couldn't play and God forbid if Lamar Jackson can't play, ooh. right? I was furious. Don't even get me started on the Thanksgiving thing. It was bad. Okay, I won't then. But you know what though? Here's the good thing is that tomorrow they're going to play on my birthday, which is awesome. Which is awesome. Yes. Three, the kickoff is at three forty. Eastern time? Yeah. Why so early? I don't know. <laughs> oh, you know why? Because there's the Rocky, Rockefeller lighting of the Christmas tree. They're not going to make it early for the Rockefeller lighting of the Christmas tree. Oh, that's what I read. Are you serious? So, so many people tune into that, like 12 million, that they pushed the game ahead because of that. So, so all these people are going to look at the Charlie Brown Christmas tree? Yep. Like half dead? Yep. All right. Well, whatever. Float your boat. That's fine. All right. I don't know. All I so, know is that they better get a win. That's all. Mm. Well, we'll see. Yeah. You know, there's another team that that won throughout the whole thing and lost in the Super Bowl. So it, there's no guarantee. Nope. You can be an undefeated team and lose. So. Right. Um, last week's show was very interesting, as is this week's show. This one might be even better just simply because Mike and Mark aren't here. But um, I want to read a few comments from our current show with Andy Beersack. For those of you who don't know Andy, he's a friend of the show and he is the lead singer of Black Veil Brides. So please check him and the band out in their new single uh, just hit, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, Scarlet Cross is a great video and a great song. Check them out. But I wanted to read a few comments. Mick Watkins says, Andy's a cool cat. The dude knows what's up and I respect the hell out of him. Yeah, he is a smart guy. Andy knows the business side of the industry and we have a great conversation uh let me see what 
else do we have here? A lot of Black, Black Veil Bride fans are jumping on just saying Andy because they all love him, which is understandable. Um, he's okay. Yeah. He's, he's, a, I, he's, a, he's a Bengals fan, so we'll just let that one go. Yeah, and then uh, A. Steinman says, awesome episode, guys. I need to check out some BBB music. Anyways, I think one of the things I always loved about KISS was the diversity of their albums. I mean, for the most part, every album was cohesive within itself, but not album to album. You can listen to hard rock, heavy metal KISS, like Destroyer, Creatures, Revenge, or uh, Carnival of Souls, or maybe a poppier KISS, like Unmasked or Crazy Nights, a more raw garage um, garage band, almost punk like hotter than hell type of kiss, whatever you want. He's right. So guys, thank you so much. We really appreciate you always making comments. We try to read each and every one of them and uh, we appreciate the support. Woo Absolutely. Yeah. So what's on your mind, Lisa? What do you want to talk about today? So, before we have our guest. Let's, let's say, um, what about uh, the, the, I see a lot of the kiss auctions creeping up. Yeah. Um, I know that Tommy, you did some, but I'm starting to see a lot of these auctions start popping up more and more. Um, I know Kenny oh. Bentley and Bruce are going to do one on New Year's Eve. So like mm -hmm. I said, I'm starting to see a lot of these popping up a lot. Well, you know, it's it, Kyle had bought uh, a Kiss collection. He still had a lot of stuff. And I encouraged him to start doing auctions to sell some of this stuff off, which he has done. And he's been having so much fun that I've joined him because I realized I still had a lot of stuff that I need to get rid of that I didn't think that I had anymore, but I do. And so if you guys are KISS collectors and you're looking to buy stuff, or if you're just looking for something to do on a weeknight or a weekend because you're bored and sitting around doing nothing, go to the Facebook page, KISS Live Auctions. You have to join the group. They'll ask you a couple of questions. And then once you join the group, you can tune in and watch any auction that you want. So to Lisa's point, uh, Kenny Begley, one of the many auctioneers on this page, uh, has been doing stuff with Keith LaRue and PJ, Pat, um, Ace's uh, manager. They did a lot of stuff for charity. So they sold off, God, it had to have been hundreds and hundreds of, of Eric Singer drumsticks they were all signed and they were all from the different cities so you could buy the city of the show that you were at and then you know he also kenny always has great auctions and uh, along with a uh, bill and all the other guys and girls now we've got tina um and they do auctions and so if you for someone like myself kyle will do an auction and i'll just jump on with him and i'll sell a few items and he'll sell a few items and we just make a fun evening of it so you can tune in for free you don't have to bid and you never know what you're going to see i've seen some of the rarest kiss stuff to some of the most common stuff um a friend of ours a month or so ago uh, mike had the kiss puffy stickers all four of them yeah which that was the holy grail for somebody um but you can pick up really cool um vinyl and t-shirts and posters and belt buckles and uh, you know what kiss is and even if like you said even if you don't want to bid on things it's like a little mini kiss party you know grab a cocktail <laughs> and just hang out you know you're hanging out with some kiss peeps and again they also do a lot of auctions i mean uh, no, i'm sorry not auctions but for uh you know, for benefits and for charities and such. So I know that this Saturday, um, December 12th, they're going to do one um, uh, for Rock and Recovery. And uh, Carl uh, Carl Cochran, I'm yeah. just reading it because I love Carl. Um, yes. He is such a phenomenal guy. And it says, uh, the special auction benefiting the Rock and Recovery Foundation and our friend Carl Cochran of ESP, who was Inger Singer, Eric Singer Project, um, you know, Oh, this is so here's this is interesting. This is not an auction. This is not an auction you want to miss. A lot of donated items from Ace and Bruce. Um, What's the auction? date? Pardon me? What's the date? December 12th. Yeah, see, so this this show will drop on the 8th, which is yep. next Tuesday. So not only do uh, do you have the auction on the 12th. There will be auctions every night leading up to that 
into the following weeks as well. I think Kyle and, have, and I have one either the day that this launches or the Thursday. So to Lisa's point, there's a lot of donated items and all that money goes to Carl to help him with his recovery. So you can, you can support someone and make a difference in someone's life. At the same time, you can buy some really cool kiss stuff. Now, not every single auction is tied to, to something like that. Right. But nonetheless, I mean, I, I've got so much stuff. Like here. <laughs> this is the kind of stuff that you'll find at these auctions. Here is the Kiss solo album box set. Ooh, that's four, pretty tall. Yeah, colored vinyl. All right. It's, it, and it comes with like a, a mat, you know, a, an LP mat. That's nice. Yeah. So my point is, that's just like one thing out of, you know, thousands. You can find uh, history box sets. You can find DVDs. They have, like I said, posters, T-shirts. Every single person who's selling stuff has different things. Like I have a whole set of Japanese vinyl. Original Japanese vinyl, first print. I'm yeah, going to be putting looking, that up for I'm sale. I'm for the originals too. I've got that. That's what I want. Yes. Originals too. I've got the original solo solo posters from 77. So my point is, is that there's all kinds of different stuff. Kyle has piles of stuff, piles of stuff. And it's everything from the 70s stuff all the way up. So um, New and Year's Eve. Fun times. You know, the yeah. And, and so I have to tell you, the hosts of that Saturday one, the Benefit Rock and Recovery, yeah, um, is uh, Lori Georgevich. If I said your name wrong, I completely apologize. Uh, our our friend Russell and Ron yeah. Buckley. Oh, perfect. So be, I mean, again, even if you don't want to bid, it's fun to hang out. It's a live thing. That'll be fun. So. It is because I look, I, I'm getting rid of stuff because I'm downsizing. I'm at the point where I know sooner or later we're going to sell. And I don't want to haul off piles of stuff somewhere else. So that's my purpose. I'm keeping a few things that I love, but most of the rest of it I'm getting rid of. Um, but having said that, though, it's fun just to hang out. So even though I'm not buying stuff, I will watch these auctions during yeah. the week because it's fun to see things I've never seen before. And always I see stuff that I'm like, holy smokes, I've never seen that before. You know, like Bill a few weeks ago had a, a colored vinyl from of unmasked from i don't know some other country and it was like a marble vinyl i've never seen one of those before um you know charlie mcchicken always has something interesting there's just so and everyone's really nice and here's the really cool thing is with these auctions you don't have to worry about it not being what it what it is so it's like if i was selling this bell which is this is for mark all right you can physically see it you can see the quality that it is, what it is, and so you know what you're bidding on, and you don't have to feel like it's being said that the record is mint when in reality you get it and it's all beat to shit. So I, I'm all for it because it's fun to watch. It's fun to see these things. Um, the Bruce Mommy, are you doing something tomorrow? Wednesday night, but this will be passed by then. Oh, that's right. And this I'm comes sorry. out. I'm sorry. But but that's okay though. But Bruce, um, his auction on New Year's Eve will be great because Lisa's been on with him and they did an auction where Bruce was literally selling off personal items from his collection. And Lisa did this thing that it was, a, it's an air car picture, probably 11 by 14. I'm not really sure, but she, you know, how she has her artwork. For those of you that aren't familiar with Lisa, she's fantastic. And she does there's, some really there's, there's one of her pieces right here. I'll show you. Okay. See it right there. Oh wait, hold on. Where's the camera? It's right there. Awesome. Yeah, there you go. So I don't know. I don't know what what you call her art, but so she took this picture of Eric from Creatures, and put the rhinestones on the photo, and then did the actual fur around his neck where that the fur piece was, and it's just I don't know. I thought it was spectacular. It was really really cool, and so you'll find those types of items as well. And I just, you know, I've mentioned it before. I'm just a huge um, supporter of this, whether I'm, you know, doing an auction or not. I want you guys to support each and every one of these people. They're all very fine people. So you just need to go to Kiss Live Auctions on Facebook. It's a group. Ask to join. They'll ask you a couple of questions and boom, then you're in. That's but the one nice. thing, the one caveat, yes, the one caveat that you guys have to be aware of is if you're going to um 
bid on an auction and bid on an item. If you win that item, you need to buy it. If you don't pay, you will be kicked out because they have to make sure that, that people actually are honorable and of their word. Well, that makes sense. I would hope. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, it's just, I think it's a spectacular way to do it. Cause like I said, you don't have to buy something that you can't see. You physically know exactly what it looks like. And that's the key to the whole thing. Yep. So that's my two cents. There you go. Yeah. I know, maybe I'll buy something. Yeah. I, I've been tempted so many times and I have to just go, no. I'm going to definitely, I'm gonna definitely watch the one on the 12th because yeah. first of all, Carl Cochran is an amazing human and um, anything that I can do to support him, I'll do, but it'll be fun to watch, uh, you know, Ron and, and Russell and all the, you know, it'll be fun to watch. So. Yeah. And our condolences go out to Russell and his family right now. His mom just passed. So if any of you guys know Mr. Daniker, he's a friend of the shows, please. Um, he's a great, great him. guy. Great. Yeah, send, send, send him, send him some, some well wishes uh, for going through that hard time. But uh, like for me with these auctions, I thought I'd gotten rid of everything. And then I started looking in my attic and in a couple other places. I'm like, oh my God, I've got tubfuls of this crap. I'm not ready to sell my stuff off yet. I'm not ready yet. Well, I'm not selling everything. I'm keeping a few things that mean a lot to me, but most of it, it's like I'd much rather have it go to somebody that yeah really yeah. enjoys it. And and just because it's an auction doesn't mean that the stuff is expensive. Of course, some of the rare items are going to go for more money, but there's an awful lot of cool things to be had for ten and twenty bucks a pop. So absolutely. So there's there's items and price points for everybody. You know absolutely. You don't need to, it's not hundreds of thousands of dollars or whatever. I mean, there's, there's price points for everybody so that everybody can join in and, and have fun. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I encourage you guys to, to join and make sure they know that three sides sent you over there. I want them to know that we're, we're supporting this because we are, I think it's a really cool thing. And like Lisa said, make sure, you know, if you don't do anything else, tune in to that auction on the 12th for Carl. Um, and then Mr. Kulik will be doing his New Year's Eve auction with Kenny uh, on the on New Year's Eve. So if you want to buy something that a real Kiss um, band member owned, here's your chance. Yep, I agree. Okay, so without any further ado, let us get on to our special guest. Lisa, do you want to tell everybody about him? Yes, I would love to. So our guest today is uh, Mr. Derek Sherinian. Um he is a phenomenal, phenomenal keyboard player who played with many, many different artists. Um, you know, the creme de la creme. Um, but his, he has a great connection with Kiss in that he played on a Live 3, on the Live 3 album, um, which is really cool. So he's going to tell us some stories about Kiss. He's also going to dig into some of his other projects. Uh, he played with Ingve, he played with Billy Idol, um, played with Alice Cooper. Uh, that's where you're going to find the you know, the Eric Singer connection with that. It's really cool. He's a great guy, phenomenal keyboard player. So let's have at it with Derek. Want to get your official three sides of the coin logo and shocker tee? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. This week on Three Sides of the Coin, we are joined by keyboard extraordinaire, Derek Sherinian, and I quote, Alice, I think called you what? The Kiligula of the keyboards? It sounds familiar. <laughs> I read that. I do my research. That was, that was great. Well, yeah. Welcome, 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 Derek. We're so happy. How are you? Thank you. Thank you for having me. How are you guys doing? Really, really well. So we've got a lot to talk about today because we want to just... We don't want to just talk about Kiss. We want to talk about you as an artist and all of the different things you've done because you've got quite the resume. But I want to start it out by letting everybody know that Derek shares something really interesting with Kiss. He has the same birthday as Gene Simmons. That's true. Yeah. August so, 25. That, which is really, really cool. Yeah. Um, where would you like to start, Lisa? What, what do you want to discuss first? Well, let's start... Um... Why don't you start, Derek, how you got started and uh, 
from what I understand and what I know, you graduated from Berkeley, correct? I didn't graduate. I dropped out like most other uh, professional musicians that went there. Okay. Very All few right. people. Yeah, very few people that, that go to Berkeley graduate. They go the full four years. Most people go like for a year or two and then go, okay, I'm ready to turn pro. No, absolutely. And that's what yeah. you did. So go ahead, tell your story and tell us how everything started because I want, I'm you, from, to uh, I want you to go way back, Derek. Okay, I'll, I'll just I'll fast track you. I was born in Laguna Beach, California. I'm a California native. My family moved to Santa Cruz when I was three. And I grew up, it's a surf town. I started getting into piano lessons like around five. But then I quit playing like when I was 10 because I got into skateboarding and, and surfing like every other kid. But then I met a kid that was from San Jose, which was over the hill. And we would call people from San Jose Valleys because they would come uh, every weekend to our beach towns and crowd the beaches so we wouldn't like the valley. So he was kind of a misfit, this kid, Rick Vieira. And he moved across the street from where my parents lived, but he went to the same school as me. And I remember that he uh, just kind of was different, but he was into Kiss. And he was into Aerosmith and he, and he played electric guitar. And I used to walk home from school with him and I used to hang out with him. And he had an electric guitar and he had like Kiss albums and I'd never seen it before. And he had Black Sabbath. And this is the kid that turned me on to rock and roll. And his mom had a piano in his house. So I said, oh, I used to play piano. And I saw like a G chord and I started playing chords. He goes, oh, try this. And so he's playing chords on guitar. And I started following him on the piano going, wow, this is, this is cool. You know, I kind of like this. And then as, as time went on, I started getting into bands and started getting equipment and just started practicing and, and, and playing with as many people as possible. And it just built from there. So what was the first band that you uh, played in? I think the very first band was a band called Smoke, which was in the, the junior high talent show in eighth grade. And I still know the guys in the band and, and talk to them. But that was the first time that I really uh, felt the power of, wow, I'm not just some kid going to school. If you're in a band, there's a whole different way that people perceive you and then all of a sudden you know you're somebody and I was not good in sports I wasn't you know popular really I was just like a normal kid but now all of a sudden I felt like I had a superpower and I just never turned it back from there and I just kept going and and building it up and then it's at uh, my junior year of high school I took my GED and I got a scholarship to Berkeley College of Music when I was 16. And that's when I moved to Boston in 82 and went to school for two years there. And I'm curious, you had mentioned earlier that you, you went for a couple of years and then you didn't graduate. You moved and went pro and a lot of people do that. What is it? Why is that? Well, when I say pro, I was I didn't I didn't go from Berkeley to pro. I went from Berkeley right. to groveling for three years before turning Fair. pro. But but that was Fair. the spirit, though, that you were ready to go test the waters, and and you felt like your skill set was enough that you could go out and in the marketplace and and give it a shot. And so I was, you know, eighteen at that point. So what's it like to go to school at Berkeley? What what is the purpose for some, for the listeners who aren't musicians? What is it about Berkeley and what is it that you're learning when you go there? Well, it's a very, it's one of the, the top jazz schools. It's not a classical school like Juilliard, but it's more jazz based and pop based and um, arranging and a lot of other different things and music business courses. They have a lot more facets to it. And so, it's a finishing school. So if you go to Berkeley, there's a wealth of information there that if you go there focused, you could walk out of there really um, with a lot of information. But more importantly from what, than what the school has to teach you, it's the students. And it's a microcosm of the real music business. You'll find that the top players in the the uh, school all would congregate and start playing together. And these are the guys that ended up having careers 
after school. Al Petrelli, who's a dear, my oldest friend, was the one who uh, got me hired for Alice Cooper. He was the music director, and I knew him from Berkeley. And then he went on to play in Megadeth. And now he's the, the director, musical director for TSO, that huge okay. production. So, I mean, he's gone on to do amazing things. Will Calhoun was there. We used to play together. And he was the drummer for Will, uh, Living Color. Oh, yeah. Who had a great, great career. And he does tons of sessions. And there was another guy, Scott Crago, drummer. He ended up touring for the Eagles. I think he's been the drummer for the Eagles the last 15 years or whatever. So there's a bunch of kids that were there at the same time. That's now, kind of be exciting. Oh, sorry, Tommy, go ahead. To see, just to see other people, friends of yours also have success. No, it's great. And seeing, seeing all of these guys along you know, the years, like I would see Will Calhoun at NAMM shows and uh, we'd always give each other a big hug and smile because we both came from the same place. We know, yeah. uh, we know what it took to, uh, to get through that and, and it's really cool. Nice. Quick, um, so you said that you, you know, you were turned on, to, turned on to Kiss, but what other musical influences did you grow up listening to? I know you're a big Van Halen fan. I started off, it started off with, with Kiss, Aerosmith, Queen, ACDC, Ted Nugent. That was like the, the rock stuff that I really got into. I was into Elton John earlier, but when I got bit by the hard rock bug, those were the bands. Then UFO, I was really into Michael Schenker, was like a really big influence, which will tie him into our, our story conversation later because it's really cool. But um, yeah, UFO and then Van Halen one came out in 78 and then it was game over. That was just like, fuck, his playing just totally inspired me and, and just reshaped the whole way I live my life and, and my priorities of being a player. And even though I'm not a guitar player, it's just the way he approaches his instrument and his style of the way of playing. It's just it's everything. It's killer. And, and I agree with that. And in fact, I'd like to ask you this question as a musician. Some of the older people who are maybe a generation before us, because you and I are about the same age, they go on and on and on about Jimi Hendrix. And I don't want to take anything away from Jimi Hendrix. But for me, Jimi Hendrix just didn't do anything for me. I, I think part of it was there was just that I don't, I'm not a big fan of the songs. But, you know, you, you, you talk to some of these people and, and what's his name? Uh, Crosby, David Crosby took a lot of crap in the press lately because he kind of dogged Edward. After All right, he made that comment. Away. Right. Yeah, and, and I expect him to be like that because he seems like he'd probably be a dick, you know? But he said that, that Jimi Hendrix revolutionized guitar. And I would say that Eddie Van Halen revolutionized it even more than Jimi Hendrix because I think he effectively changed the lives of more people and made them want to be musicians. What's your point? I don't know. It's hard. I think a lot of it is generational and a lot of it is perspective. I mean, to be around, it was pretty heavy duty when Hendrix came out, when he did and what he was doing, a, a black man during the Vietnam era against all of the crazy stuff, playing the national anthem, the voice, the whole package, the image. It was just an awesome spectacle. And what he was doing as far as guitar wise, he was the first one to really get uh, feedback and distorted tone and dive bombs and, and cranking through the marshals the way he did. And so he really did open up. He was a game changer and, and, Edward Van Halen was as well. And so it's going to be hard to really get into a debate of who, who was more of one. Well, because and I don't want technically, to take technically Hendrix, without Hendrix, paved the way for Van Halen. Van Halen saw the possibilities. You can't be it until you see it a lot of times. Right. And I don't and want so to take anything away from Hendrix for all of you guys who are listening that are big Hendrix fans. I just feel like in my life that Eddie played every much of a role to me as Jimi Hendrix maybe did to David Crosby. So therefore, he is just as valid to me. I'm with you, huh, dude. I'm with you. You can't. You're preaching to the choir. So I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. Well, so then let's talk a little kiss. How All right. you, you grew up, you were a fan of theirs. Do you remember the first? I kiss was, I, the, the first record I was exposed to was Alive 2. Okay. 
so all of those songs like would crank over and over again then listening back to you know the earlier records but i was into it but i wasn't hardcore like yeah. i did paint i did i was paul stanley for my 16th birthday i did do it for for halloween so that was pretty cool do you have it's pictures really derek there is somewhere at my mom's house i have to find it <laughs> that'd be great but um but i wasn't hardcore into it like a lot of people like right. a lot of my friends were like totally into blah, 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 all into the shit but i loved i thought kiss was cool whatever and then i fo- i've always followed followed it through the years i think i fell off on dynasty i think it started getting a little uh, i was thinking of other things i was more into what was that 79 dynasty yeah yeah so by then i, I was already into van halen and that was van halen 2 was out by then so they I you moved on even on my radar oh yeah a lot of people did you know that and that was their own doing yeah you know they lost their fan base but so, even before then like 77 i was into 76 77 i was listening to acdc aerosmith queen news of the world like toys of the attic came out that year so i was way more into that than kiss and how did that music influence you as a keyboard player I think it's just more the classic rock bass, more in my writing, but it's just an approach and a spirit more okay. than anything else. It's just in my DNA hard. Can you, can you expand on that as far as your, the writing piece of it? What, what is it that you get? Just rock. It's a vibe. You know, you can't fake it and you either love that music and you've digested it and you've, processed it as a musician through your experimentation where you you know all songwriting is really if you want to break it down it's experimenting and finding those those chords through experimentation okay yeah because they i i feel like we and we've had this discussion a lot where kiss has been kind of passed off by their peers and some musical people saying that because their songs are more simple, I suppose, whatever term you want to use, that somehow they're not as valid as a Led Zeppelin or a, a Queen, Aerosmith, choose whoever you want. Well, that's that's up to the listener to decide. Yeah. You know, that's not up to one person to say because, you know, there's probably songs that mean as much to a Kiss fan as a Led Zeppelin song does to a Led Zeppelin fan. So right, exactly. it's not and fair. I- it's, it's like, uh, to me, I, I've always felt like if it's a good song, it's a good song regardless, because if, if that held water, then all the Beatles songs wouldn't be any good because they're simple, maybe in comparison to, say, some of the stuff you did with Dream Theater. I don't know. But it's, uh, if it's a good song, it's a good song. Absolutely. ACDC is as simple as they come, but you could have the most technical band in the world with the greatest musicians playing on stage, and then all... ACDC comes on afterwards with the hell's bells with the bell ringing and the crowd goes fucking nuts. And it's, yeah. it's about, you know, so it's the feeling and what takes you, takes you to where it takes you, uh, yeah, you know, maybe in your it's teenage- energy, it's called energy and it's yeah. different styles of music have different by or different uh, powers of energy and, and rock music. That's why we love it, man. It's fucking awesome. How did you get hooked up with kiss? I got through uh, through Eric Singer. Um, okay. Eric and I played in Alice Cooper together okay. for the Trash Tour, eighty nine, ninety, and then the Hey Stupid Tour, ninety one, ninety two, and then after that was done, Eric got hired mm-hmm. for the drum position, and then they needed an off stage keyboardist, and Eric called me, and and I came in, pretty much. I mean, the gig was pretty. They, my coming in for the audition was more of a formality you know just from eric singer vouching for me was enough right oh well, that's pretty but, cool so, yeah so, so tell us some stories what was it like to be on the road in that particular situation well it was very cool i mean gene and paul were, were very uh, they're very powerful figures and it's very very cool how they run their business and what impressed me right away was they they were very on top of everything from the crew and they signed all the checks that went out and 
you just got the sense that they were the opposite of this, the drug head musician that just, Hey man, I just like to play, you know, these guys were very sharp and uh, just very professional. And, you, and I really liked being around that. Okay. And so just from your experience, do you think that they are a little bit more of a rare breed? Cause when I look at them uh, and, and speaking to both of them, and this isn't taking away from other musicians, but there's a lot of musicians I've met and spoken to that are very, very creative because that's part of being a musician, but they don't have the business acumen, whatever that is. And Gina Paul seemed to get both sides of it. Do you think that that's a little more rare in your business than, than common? I think it's very rare. It's more common now, but Gene and Paul have been role models for a lot of musicians in my generation because Gene, I mean, Gene especially is always known as the business one, even though Paul behind the scenes is probably doing just as much. Right. And so it's, it's both of them. And they have served as role models on how you might, you want to be if, if you have a successful band rather what not to be. Well, and it seems to me like just because they're organized and, and, represent themselves well doesn't make it any less rock and roll or any less exciting. I, I, I just have read so many biographies from these different artists who literally have lost everything to management and other people because they were too busy having fun and playing and touring and partying and didn't stop to think about where the money was going. Yeah. Well, they learned. I mean, if any, I mean, I read the one book, Kiss and Sell. I'm not yeah. sure how accurate it is, but for, for my takeaway from it was that they lost a lot of money from the coal mine investment that something got squirrely there and their business managers left the money in and didn't pull it out. And there was huge penalties and it was like shocking. And I think yeah. after that happened, they learned, they, right. they learned that they were never going to be in that situation again. And sometimes right. it takes something like that to get, that kind of, uh, you know, determination to not get fucked again. Right. So you know? are there, did you notice, are there fans different than other fans or are rock fans pretty much rock fans all the way across the board? No, I mean, Kiss, they're hardcore. I mean, these, everyone, the Kiss fans love Kiss and it's awesome. And I think the, the loyalty that they've shown throughout the years, it's amazing. The fact that, that, they can go out and play stadiums and arenas and, and do the business that they do in, in a 20 or 2019, at least it's yeah. amazing. Amazing. It, it really is. I mean, kudos to anyone who's still around from that time frame, whether it be Ario Speedwagon or Kiss or whoever cheap trick. We talk about them a lot. They're one of our favorites. Those guys are just, they're constantly. Yeah. Around. Amazing. You really got to tip your hat when you see guys, in their 60s and even 70s out playing yeah oh absolutely so t tell us some stories from when you were on the road with them though there was no nothing really too crazy i just remember um when we were recording a live three it was probably at two or three different venues i think the the concert was okay. and it was just cool getting the the show together and there was just a lot of excitement and I remember it was a lot of fun. It was different for me because I was off stage and that was the first time I've ever done a, a tour like that. And what's but, that like? And where do they set you up? Well, I was on stage right and my head would be just over the stage like this. And then my keyboard setup would be underneath and I would be on Gene's side. So I would be, you know, watching it. I had the best view probably. I mean, not from the front, but from the side. I mean, I was fucking right there. Right. And I suppose they needed needed you off stage just because it's the four of them. Oh, we lost we lost your can't hear you. We lost you. I think when you moved your computer it might have How's this? There. There we go. Got you back. Great. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. So is this the only tour you ever did where you're off the side of the stage? Yes, for sure. 
Okay. And yeah. that, how do you, how do you figure out or how do you get the timing down with all that? Or is it, is it not that big of a deal? No, well, we rehearsed, we were in rehearsal for a month prior to the tour. So, you know, you had it down. The performance was all dialed in and I, I could visually, as long as I could hear, you know, the music, I don't even need to see them. Oh, okay. I suppose. Yeah. See, cause I'm yeah. not a musician. So this is all yeah. foreign to me. I just remember that was the only gig I've ever played that had massive pyro. And so you'd have to time when the bombs go off, you'd cover your ears to save your, your ears. <laughs> and you must've been really close to the pyro too. I mean, I was, right I was totally right there. <laughs> One false move. Uh, wait, I have a quick question. I, I had to miss a little cause I had to go yell at my children. Um, besides the live three and revenge, did you play on any other Kiss albums or just those two? Not on any, oh, I didn't play on Revenge. Not on Revenge, okay. No, just a live three. And I'm on the Ramones tribute okay. song that they did. I thought you were on Revenge. No, I came in after. Okay. Sorry, I had to miss a lot there. I apologize for that. Oh, it's okay. No, that's Sorry. all right. Um, go ahead, Tommy. Well, so then I, wanna, I want to, uh, have you now talk about you because you've got you've got such an amazing pedigree of different things that you've done and i know that we need to talk about house of lords a little bit i, don't, I didn't play in house of lords. oh i'm sorry i i apologize i i for some reason was thinking that you did a small student i did play i did play on one house of lords record though right yeah. song, so any 20 years ago right any gene simmons stories from that no, I mean, I had nothing, Gene Simmons had nothing to do with when I played on House of Lords. But Gene, oh, I'll, here's a great Gene Simmons story. So I remember at the time I got a new endorsement. I forgot which company it was, but they wanted to do an ad. And the fact that I was in Kiss, they wanted to, you know, mention Derek Sherinian on the Kiss tour or whatever. So I went to Gene and I go, hey, Gene, I got this new endorsement and they want to do a, a full page ad. Is it OK uh, to drop the Kiss credit? And Gene goes, he pulls me aside. And he goes, listen, there's two things that rock fans hate, sidemen and keyboard players. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and I go, okay, well, there it is. Jeez. I thought that was I thought that was really funny. Well, yeah, and the reason I asked that question because the tie-in is is Gene had them on his label. So if I didn't ask the question, then everyone would be jumping down our throats saying, Well, why do No, but you know what? That band is loving you that you're giving them so much airtime in real estate. They they could probably do a comeback. Oh yeah, you know, people, and they had a pretty good following, you know, because there's a lot of people who followed that band simply because of Greg, because they followed um, Angel. It all kind of yeah. ties together, you know. That was amazing, um, that band. I remember getting those records. They were on Casablanca also, right? Yes, yeah, they so were. So that was like, they were like, the Kiss was the, the dark band and Angel was the light band. But I remember Greg Jufria, he, this guy had this, fucking head of hair it was totally amazing and his uh, keyboard rig it was like keith emerson's rig but even totally. more yes. yeah he does oh, the yeah. emerson split eagle and then he had the modular the emerson modular it. in the back yeah. and and god god bless him nicest guy and we've actually communicated a couple times but i really don't know i mean how good that guy can play I mean, I, yeah, I, I can't can, really yeah. tell, he, but it's like all like sequence and program. But man, that guy looked more amazing. Like, that's amazing. That guy's look. Well, sometimes that's all it takes, you know? Ah. So for the people that are not familiar with your work, uh, there's several other bands I really, I want to talk about. And one of them, first off, is the a Black Country Communion. Okay. I thought they were, I thought that was a great band. Tell people Still how together. that yeah but you guys took the you took the hiatus for a while wasn't it because yeah. of Bonamasso and his touring and all of that sort of thing yeah. um tell people about this because for those of you that haven't listened to them they're really really good and this is something you need to check out um black, tell us black, the history of that black country communion was born in like two, 2009 and it started with glenn hughes was playing a solo show at the house of blues and Joe Bonamassa sat in with him 
and producer Kevin Shirley was at the gig and Kevin Shirley had the idea, you know what, we need to put a band around these two guys. And so Kevin made uh, two phone calls. He called Jason Bonham for drums and then he called me for keyboards. And so we made, we went into the studio and at first was supposed to start off as just uh, recording like, four songs or whatever, just to see what it sounded like. So we were in this recording studio in Malibu. I forgot what it was called. But it turned out that the sessions got extended for a week, and we ended up recording 10 or 11 songs. We did a whole record in one week, wrote and record. That's crazy. And so it was like, wow, cool. So we put the record out. It comes out like five months later. And the record took off and it was it did surprisingly well like everyone was vibrating on it and it was to the point where everyone was saying well you guys have to tour on this you can't just put a record out like this there was too much of a buzz and so joe uh made the decision that we were going to go out and play for we did 12 weeks and that was in 2000 11 2011 and uh that was the last time we went and did a full tour like that because at the end of the day joe is his solo career is so successful bless him that it's so great it's for him to take time away from it it's very difficult so that's why black country communion does you know few and far between you know, very few gigs, but even we've done four, what is it? One, two, three, four records. Yep. So we're talking about doing the fifth one next year. Do you think you'll ever tour again as, as a band? I don't know if we'll do a full on tour, but we'll do sporadic dates and, you know, whatever Joe wants to do, I'm down for it. And I think that's everyone's position. And because we have a lot of fun doing it and a lot of people love that band. Eric Singer oh. said to me that, that he goes, Derek, you know, I like a lot of the bands that you're playing with. He goes, I like Sons of Apollo, but Black Country Communion, if that was a full-time band, that would be a very successful, you know, touring band. That's got to also be kind of hard for you in the respect that I know that you respect Joe and, and what he's doing from a soul standpoint. I'm assuming Glenn also has his commitments. All of you guys do. But that's got to be also hard where it's like, I can tell that by the way you speak of it, how much you love it, that it's it's got to be one of those things where you'd love to just get out and play live. Not granted, it would be, no hey, right now. listen, man, it would be fantastic, but it is what it is. And so I'm grateful, you know, whenever Joe wants to do it, I'm in. Well, I will tell you, Derek, that as a performer, you really have an outstanding stage presence when you play. You can tell that you are really into it. You love what you do. Um, you are a phenomenal player on stage. Thank you very much. Well, I miss playing. I think a lot of my colleagues and <laughs> friends, I mean, all of us miss touring. It was really tough. I mean, we were out with Sons of Apollo in Europe building momentum and then it just got shut down and it just felt so weird after the preparation of getting ready and learning all the songs and you know just all the preparation only to have the plug pulled you know it was very difficult and we were one of the first we were definitely one of the first bands to publicly say hey we're going home because of this thing and and then shortly after just an avalanche of bands pulled the plug because there's just no way, man. Well, the last time I saw you was in February. So at, right after that show, it was in Boston. Was it a... Uh, Sons of a February, was it earlier? No, it was February. Oh, okay. February 4th or 5th or something like that. Yeah, so, yeah, it just... Yeah, it's a real drag. This year has been a drag for sure. Mm -hmm. It's been hard story. for everybody, but you know, we had Andy Beersack on last week of Black Veil Brides and we were talking about touring because they've got festivals that they've got lined up next summer and different things like that. And everyone's kind of hoping that that'll be um, something that stays together. But I want to mention to people, if you guys want to take a week back and check out, we talk a lot also about just you know, like what you're saying, how hard it hit everybody has been and the cost of the insurance and all of the other things it's going to take to get the venues to open again. 
what a mess, you know. So we'll see what happens. There's a lot of uncertainty out the, in the air for everyone. So we're all just playing it by ear. All I can do and all everyone else can do is just try to make the most of it and stay productive. I'm, I'm here in my studio every day writing. Um, I'm already working on my next solo record and just trying to stay productive. Doing a lot of keyboard sessions every day, just in here and I treat it like a job. And I you, think of it as just to. writing songs and, and putting it in the vault for the future, you know? Well, yeah, it, it, at least that way you can walk away from this pandemic and, and, and be like, okay, I, I accomplished something with my- No, time. and be ready to hit the ground running once everything opens up. And so everything, you're just sharp and on top of it. Tell us about your touring time with Alice Cooper and with Mr. Eric Singer. What was that like? I'll tell you, and Eric will say it as well, that that period with Alice on the trash tour was the most fun we've ever had. We were really? just, yeah. I was the first time ever touring on a huge tour, and he had a big record. That song, Poison, was a number six single. Yep. One of the biggest songs of the summer. And uh, there was a buzz on that tour. Like every city we played, like the radio stations would be there and the record companies of the, the uh, regionals for the city, everyone is buzzing when there's a hit song. And I really noticed the difference between that and then just doing a nostalgia tour. And what's, what's sad is that that first tour was the most buzz I ever felt. <laughs> that was 30 years ago because of that the hit single and then right. everything else <laughs> has been downslide <laughs> but in different things i mean that's playing in someone else's band i've had satisfaction of going out with my own band and and being a band member as opposed to a side band but i'm talking as just as far as excitement goes having that hit single well, who was playing in the band then it was you and derek i mean you and eric and Tommy Caradonna, T Bone, and Al Petrelli, Al and Petrelli. Pete Friesen. Pete Friesen That's on the guitar. That's who I couldn't remember. Pete Friesen. Yeah. That's right. That's right. We were all so young and green, and we really thought we were rock stars. Not Eric. He was like older than us, so we'd always yeah. uh, give him shit. But the great story was Eric was in Badlands, and then he got fired, and a week later he was auditioning for Alice. And he, he gets the gig with Alice. And I remember right away, Eric and I always have like a shit stirring uh, relationship, busting balls. And right out of the shoot, I said to Alice, because Eric had his long blonde hair, I said, you're going to make him dye his hair, aren't you, Alice? And, and Eric's like, look at me like, you fucking punk or whatever. <laughs> and so then once Eric got the gig, and I already felt because I'd been touring with Alice for like six months and we were on MTV and I already, I thought I was a fucking rock star and Eric was in this low, lowly band Badlands or whatever. And all of a sudden he's joining us. And I said to Eric, I, this was me to Eric Singer that I'm 10 years younger. I said, welcome to the big leagues kid. <laughs> if you ask well, him, they'll tell you it's true. It's really funny. Oh, great. Well, welcome Eric, to the big leagues kid. Eric's such a nice guy too. He's, he's the best. You know, all those guys are, they're all super nice. So you do two tours with Alice Cooper. You've done solo stuff in between. I also want to touch on Dream Theater because mm -hmm. there's a lot of fans of Dream Theater. Tell us about how that got, how you got involved in Dream Theater and what your time was like with those guys. Well, the KISS tour ended in 90, is it 93? Revenge? Yeah. yeah. So not, 93 Revenge. And so right around that time, Seattle, all the Seattle bands started coming out and just none of the hard rock bands were touring at all. There's this whole new revolution. Yeah. All this, none of these Seattle bands had any keyboards whatsoever. So it was like a really dark period in 94 where there was just nothing going on. And I remember at the end of the of 94, I get a phone call from, who was it? I forgot who told me about it, but they said that this progressive rock band Dream Theater was hiring a keyboard player. Now I heard the song, Pull Me Under, which I thought was pretty cool 
I thought it sounded like Queensryche, but, but with better musicians when I heard the song. But I thought it was good, though. I thought the chorus was hooky. And so I knew who the band was. And so they were looking for, for keyboards, and I got an audition set up. And I remember hearing the music that I had to learn, and it was, it was very scary because it's very technical, and it's, it was definitely more difficult than anything I've played in the past, but I really wanted to, to, uh, to dig in and, and give it my best shot. So I went into audition, long story short. Well, wait, a second, up, though, before, wait a minute, Derek, before you go any further, I want to ask a question. So yeah. you get this tape, you know the song, but you, you, you're, you're saying that this is more challenging than what you've done in the past. How do you prepare for something like this? How do you, how do you rise up to a challenge like that? Repetition, practicing slow and working it up to speed and then retaining it. Okay. It's like a bunch of moving parts. And um, so, so you... I went in, basically I went in for the audition and I, I felt like it could have gone either way. And I ended up getting the call and I did a four year run with the band. And I'll tell you what, my musicianship level from when I started and then after year four, it just went up like huge levels, insane amounts. So when you were first practicing for this, do you literally take the tape, slow it down? No. In, or how, no, how, there's how no do you, slowing down. So how, how do you, you just said you, you practice and you build up. So how, how do you do that? Well, like if there's like a, a fast unison line or whatever, they would give me Hold on. Okay. Oh, I gotta just give me a second. Are you there? Yeah. So yeah, like if there's certain lines that I'd have the notes written out so I can know what they are. But okay. a lot of it would just be listening to the music over and over again and playing along with it. And this is before Pro Tools having it on the screen. This is like having to use a, a ghetto blaster. Okay. Like keyboard, total old school style, but it was very difficult and it was a two and a half hour set and it was music that I didn't, I've never heard before, odd time signatures, crazy stuff. But I, I made a deal with myself that if I could get through that first show and learn this material that anything that would come my way musically would, would I, I should be able to handle. Well, it's gotta be a real shot in the arm. You know, yeah. to to accomplish that, and feel no, it's great. There's listen, I mean, whether you like Dream Theater or not, to be able to play in that band and be able to play those routines, you have to be a badass player. I mean, right. there's just no way around it. There's no shortcuts. Well, and I've heard that from a lot of different people of how incredibly technical that is. Just like a lot of the early Rush material as well. That the early rush is like child's play compared to the dream theater stuff, believe me. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So you did four years with them. Mm -hmm. And then where did you move from there? I went to from dream theater to um, Ingve Malmsteen. I did a quick tour with Ingve. Okay. And what was that like? Because I've heard all kinds of stories about him. It was wild, and I've always been a, a big Ingve fan. He was like after Eddie Van Halen and Randy Rhodes, Ingve came out in '82 or '83, and I remember I was going to Berkeley at the time, and he was just everyone was talking about Ingve, and so I was a huge fan, and so to be able to play with him was really really cool. And we went to South America, and then it ended up he played on uh, my solo record. Oh, okay. after I did, I played on, I did a tour with him. I played on his record and then he played on my record. And then I've played other shows with Ingbe throughout the years. So you may, you maintain a good relationship with him. Absolutely. Yeah. I just did some shows with him on the Generation X tour in Asia with Steve Vai and Zach and, okay. and Nuno and Ingbe was on the tour. And so it was always, it was great playing with him and, and seeing him. To tell the fans some things about, Ingve, they may not know. Ingve is a uh, a really good tennis player. He, he has a tennis court. And he gets private tennis lessons, and he's really, really a good player. Surprisingly, 
Wow. Yeah. Is he, is he fun to hang around? He is. And uh, we always, he, he's very, uh, has a really good sense of humor. And, and I think he's a funny guy. I really like Yngwie and I've been friends with him for since, you know, 2000. It's almost 20, 20 years now. Well, and, you know, and, and for me, I look at his stuff and I've always appreciated him as a musician, but from a fan's perspective of just liking rock music, the thing that, that left me going eh, about his stuff is not the songs or his playing, but he, he never really had very good singers, in my opinion. I felt like... Well, no, I have, to do, I have to disagree with you. Uh, Jeff Scott Soto, who's in oh, yeah, Sons of Apollo, good. Is the original singer, I mean, I mean, that's a great record. I mean, yeah. and Jeff sounds great. And then Joe Lynn Turner, I thought was a, a great singer. And it, who else? Maybe, yeah. maybe it's just, it wasn't poppy enough for me. I don't know. You know, I'm it wasn't sure. poppy. The Joe Lynn Turner wasn't poppy enough. No, I never, I've never heard the Joe Lynn Turner stuff. So I can't say. Oh, well, that's. I, I'm saying like, of the stuff that I've been exposed to. That was so, always kind of the thing. Right. Well, so if that's what you're into, you should definitely listen to the, the Joe Lynn Turner records because a right. lot of people, I think those were the most successful oh they i would think so yeah because for me it's like i always look at at these guys who are just amazing musicians and think well why can't you just get a robin zander you know a guy like that Dude, you know great singers are few and far between that's what i've heard yeah. it really it's really a rarity to have someone it's a lot of great singers but to get those like very rare birds you know the tyler coverdale yeah freddie yeah. mercury you know those guys are rare birds true true so then what else um did you do then or after that where did you go after Ingve, then billy idol i played with billy idol for like 12 years oh that must have been which interesting. was very cool and amongst other things like i would do billy idol but then i would be making solo records along the way and doing sessions and, and stuff but billy idol was something that i would do every year for for 12 years and that was a fun gig great players steve stevens is an amazing guitar yeah. player i saw them just last year here in town and i was thoroughly impressed with how good that they looked and sounded it was just you know they still have it you know they, they yeah, really do sure. it was fun yeah, billy's a star he's awesome and derek you also did some solo work with planet x too right yes in uh 2000 i did that right around the time of ingve too i had my instrumental band planet x with tony McAlpine, virgil donati now that band if you want to talk technical playing that was even a level up from dream theater as far as craziness yeah to the point where i to the point where it got too t i had to throw my hands up to say you know what virtual you win i can't keep up with you anymore i gotta slow down man <laughs> <laughs> i have a bunch of those albums that it's it's mind-blowing it really I, like i haven't listened to that a lot of that stuff in many years and i i put some of it on and it's even uh toasting about the from animals as leaders, we were on that tour together, the Generation X. So we had breakfast a lot of times together. And he said, man, th that first Planet X record was just mind blowing. And a lot of young musicians that were not even born or just a couple years old when we made that first record, somehow there's like this cult following of people that have revisited these old records from 20 years ago. And so That's kind I of hope that maybe- though. It's great. No, it's really, really cool. So it makes me want to do uh, another record, you know, sometime soon and do some shows, hopefully in the future. Does it ever surprise you when it works out that way? Like you didn't see that one coming? You know, when you get people that, that find it later on? Oh, I, did, I had no idea that there would be legs or, or traction and have the widespread um, influence on young musicians even to this day, I mean, it, it's really cool. Yeah, that's, that's a really cool that's, thing. I think that's amazing, especially now because, you know, maybe it's because I'm older, but man, when we were growing up, 
and I'm sure you experienced this as well. You had friends who loved different types of music and they would bring records over. You guys would hang out and you'd listen to the different records and that's how you'd learn about new music. Now I don't know how they do it anymore. Yeah, you know, it, it, so it's like, it's, it, to me, it's even more mind blowing when these musicians are finding these records from 20 some odd years ago because you're like, well, how are you finding this stuff? You know, if you don't have a friend that knows about it. It's just with the internet, um, these the file sharing, I mean, that's a lot of it, but it is YouTube and people just sending links to go, hey, check this out, man. Check this band out. Or, that's sick. Check that out. You know? Yeah. Word of mouth. Absolutely. It spreads. The good stuff spreads. It's like eBay. There was no internet back then. And right. it just started off with he, he uh, had this demo that was in guitar player, Mike Varney. And then they put out this record. He joined this band, Steeler, with Ron Keel. With Ron Keel, yep. yep. And like, it was, it was a total everything. underground thing. But just the word spread of this fucking awesome Swedish guitar player that was setting the guitar world on fire. And it spread organically, yeah. you know. Yeah, that makes sense. Now with the internet, if it's really good, stuff even spreads faster. That's true. Yeah, I, I forget that because it's like I said, I'm, I'm so old school. So where where can fans um, interact with you? Where can they find you? What are you doing? This I'm is pretty much, bottom. you can find me on Instagram and Twitter and okay. DerekSherinian.com. I'm pretty accessible. Okay. And what do you got coming up? Anything, uh, anything you want to plug? Yes. Well, I have my record that I just put out in September, even though the year's almost over, called The Phoenix, which I'm very excited about. Uh, okay. Zach Wild, Kiko from Megadeth, Joe Bonamassa, Steve Vai are the guitar players, uh, Billy Sheehan, Simon Phillips on drums. Yep. And the record uh, really got great reviews worldwide. Very excited about it. And I just got greenlit from Sony to do my follow-up solo record. So I'm just oh, started the writing and thank you. And I just started putting uh, this new record together. I just played on this year, a couple of records uh, with White Snake. I played on two White Snake records. And also I played on a song on the new Michael Schenker record, oh. which was just debuted last week. And he's putting out a record in January called Immortal, which is a 50th, a uh, year celebration of his career. Yeah, I saw him tour last, I think it was last year. I, I start to forget when, but yeah, I think it was last year. And he played for like two and a half hours and went through everything. It was amazing. Oh man, he's so great. And so Michael, uh, I played on his record and you can see there's a video out on YouTube. The song is called Drilled to Kill. Drilled and to Kill. so he really, he dug my playing and I asked him if he played uh, a song on my new next record and he agreed. So He's going to be on my next record. I'm very excited about that. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. You, you've, so far, you've had quite a career. You're going to have to write a book someday. Uh, I was just going to say that. I was just going to say that. I might have to, maybe at the end. I still have some more years left. Oh, yes, you do. Okay, so everyone, you can find Derek on uh, Instagram. Uh, you can buy his new record, I'm sure, on Amazon and anywhere else that fine albums are sold. I don't know anymore about record stores, so probably online is going to be the easiest way. But you can get out there and support him, check out his music, and go find him on Instagram and follow him on uh, Twitter. Wait, I have one quick thing. Derek, didn't yeah. you jam with Eddie Van Halen in his backyard one time? Uh, I guess I did. In 2006, he had a... party and and, him. and it was very surreal and awesome and i'm very glad that i had a chance to uh to meet and play with him there's a video very, sad, very sad very sad about his passing yes. you had a smile this big on your face I was, amazing was phenomenal there's a Thank video you. working out there and john Krabi was there too right yeah, yeah. and brian tishy and and my friend stefan adika it was it was great <laughs> stefan yeah <laughs> He, who also has a coffee talk with Stefan. He's funny. Oh, I love, I've been, I've been on coffee talk twice. I think it's, he's doing a great job. I'm very proud of him. Yes, he really is. He, yeah, he's, he's getting a lot of big guests on there and had Doc McGee on twice. And, you know, he's really doing great. 
Yeah, Stefan came on, I don't know, six, eight months ago. Really funny, nice guy. So follow follow Stefan too, Adika. He's Coffee Talk. So I think you can find it on Facebook. Yeah, uh, for sure. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day like this to spend with us and tell us all about this rock and roll history that you've been a part of. It's my pleasure, guys. Thank you so much for having me on. And it's great seeing you and be safe, okay? Okay, Thanks have a great you. rest of the year. Thank you. All we'll right. see you on the road. Good to see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good to see you. Bye. Bye-bye. So that was really interesting to, you know, it, I always like talking to different musicians that have a different point of view that have worked with several different artists over their career to get a perspective. And, you know, when you look at Derek's, um, you know, playing past, he has played with some of the most amazing musicians um, from Alice to Kiss to, I mean, you know, he jammed with Eddie Van Halen, which, yeah, I'm glad you threw that in at the end because I didn't know. I mean, I didn't know that much about him because I was reading stuff off of his bio and I knew that he was with, you know, Black Country Communion and a few others, but I had no idea about the Eddie Van Halen. So I'm glad you threw that in because, well, it's Eddie Van Halen. Well, I mean, um, he's always been, I knew he was a big fan of, of Eddie Van Halen's, you know, and, um, you know, just him, you know, I met him when he played with Alice and he, he did, like I said, and I even said it there too, his stage presence is phenomenal. I don't know how anybody in the world can play a keyboard like this. If you ever watch his, the way he has his keyboards, he has them like straight up, like more, like people play like this. Yeah. His keyboards are this way. So he actually leans over and plays like this. It is really cool. You have to watch his, his stage, his stage presence is, his presence is phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. So maybe what we should do then for homework is, are you guys familiar with any of Derek's work? If you are, tell us what you like. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds reasonable? Dream Theater, Planet X, um, Dream Theater, Planet X, Sons of Apollo. Black Country yeah. Communion. Black Country Communion. Did you, I know what I forgot to mention to him is he was actually in Wayne's World. Did you know that? No, uh -uh. I did not at, know that. At the scene where... Um, Wayne and Garth come in at the, at, in the room where Alice is in the, like the green room Yeah. and he's, and, uh, they're like, we're not worthy. And Alice goes like that with his hand. Yeah. If you look Derek sitting on, on the bar in the back, so he's in the, sitting there in the background, but it's really so cool because the whole band was there, but that's really cool. Well, and if, if you guys aren't familiar with any of Derek's work, check some of this stuff out, his solo stuff, and then give us some comments and let us know what you think. Absolutely. Yeah, and we'll be back to, I think, regular next week. Michael is um, should be rejoining, and Mark, who knows, he's not coming back until he gets a new computer. Is that what he said, or is that what Michael said? He's not allowed to come back. Uh, no, we we all kind of agreed that he needs to, you know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm kidding. Find something that works. You know, he just gets so frustrated. He took his toys and went home. So he's laying on the beach, I think, today. Good for him. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, so, tomorrow's my birthday, just in case anybody cares. Yeah. She's 29. Again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You look 29. Thank you. So, okay, guys. Well, that's it for this time. We hope you enjoyed it, and we'll uh, see you next week. Do your homework. Bye. So you love the show. Go to itunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks.